Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to this next lesson in um, science. In this first lesson, we're going to be going through um, old papers, um, specifically prelim papers. And what we have already started doing is going through this question. Now, I've been looking at when you write different exam papers. The Department of Education, guys, you guys write on the 4th of November, which is this Friday coming, you write physics. And IB, you guys write physics on Monday, I mean on the 10th, um, and then again on the 18th, the chemistry, um, whereas the Department of Education, you guys write chemistry on Monday. So I think what I'm going to do today is Monday. I'm going to do physics today. I'm going to do chemistry tomorrow, and then I will do physics on Wednesday and Thursday, and then chemistry again on Friday, just so you guys can get a little bit of practice with both the subjects. Okay, well, both parts of the subject. So tomorrow is chemistry, the rest of the work is, week is physics, except for Friday, when we'll go back to chemistry. But now, what were we doing? We were talking about this girl who was playing in a bedroom with a super bouncy ball, and she threw the ball down, Dush, okay? And it hit the ground and it bounced up. Whee! Okay. And it had reached a maximum height 0.6 seconds later, which we worked out to be 1.4 meters. No, this was 1.4 meters. This was 1.4 meters. Okay, it says using the ground as reference, sketch a graph of position versus time. I kind of have already. Showing the motion of the bouncy ball from the moment the ball is thrown until it reaches the maximum height. Okay, so I must admit I've kind of done this graph already for you. It starts off with a height of of one comma four meters. It says it doesn't tell you the height. We don't ever work out a height, I don't think. Um, no. Okay, it hits the ground and bounces straight up past you and reaches a maximum of uh, 0.6 seconds, so it doesn't know it. Okay, fine. So it comes down, hits the ground, and goes up, as you can see. So we don't know what that maximum height is, but we do know that this time period takes 0.6 seconds. Um, we don't know what that period of time is, but they don't actually ask you to plot anything else. So this would be a Y in meters, and this would be a time in seconds, and obviously you would say that this is a position versus time graph. You always have to have a heading. And there you go. The position versus time graphs are the easiest ones, especially if grounds are reference, because it's exactly as you would expect it to appear on the, uh, uh, the action is, okay? Right, let's look at a new question. It says scientists are investigating the possibility of making use of a subsurface nuclear explosive in order to deflect asteroids from possible collision from the Earth. Oh, someone's been watching some science fiction movies. Okay, so it says such a nuclear explosive. You guys are a bit young, but a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there was a movie that kind of did this with it, and it had, oh, who did they have it in? It had Bruce Willis, and it had... Um, Arwen from Lord of the Rings, that lady. Anyway, and it had a whole bunch of very good actors, including Bruce, uh, what's his name? The guy who play, currently is playing Batman? Yeah, I can't remember their names. Anyway, they were all in it, and they went up to this big asteroid, that they were, and they were trying to split it by putting some nuclear explosive in the middle of it. So I think the dude who wrote this probably watched that movie. I think it was called Armageddon. Yes, the movie is called Armageddon. Anyway. <laughs> Long story short, such a nuclear explosive was buried beneath the surface of the asteroid of mass 3.6 times 10 to the 19 kilograms, okay? Before destination, a stationary astronaut on a nearby spacecraft measures the velocity of the astronaut to be 5 meters per second toward the constellation of Orion, okay? So they're using Orion as their measuring point, okay? It says, when the explosive was detonated, the asteroid split into two fragments, A and B. Okay, so that's good. It did work. The explosion projected the two fragments, A and B, in opposite directions towards the constellations of Orion and Scorpius with speeds of 8 meters per second and 2 meters per second, respectively. 
Okay. All speeds are obviously measured relative to the spaceship. Okay, so basically this is just after all this confusing stuff about spacecraft and everything else, and astronauts and nuclear explosions. It's a momentum question. And how can you tell? Because of this question, yeah. It says, stating words, the principle of conservation of linear momentum. So really they're trying to make things easy for you. And they're saying, let's have a look at this. So stating words, the principle of conservation of linear momentum. In an isolated system, the linear momentum remains constant in both magnitude and direction. That's it. Next it says, show that fragment A, fragment A has a mass of 2.52 times to 10 to the 19 kilograms. Okay. Right, so now let's have a look at it. Okay, so for momentum, we know that P before always equals P after. And guys, you have to write something along the lines of this, or you have to write the mass of the astrid, the mass of this times by the initial velocity of this before is equal to the mass of A um, after the collision, sorry, after collision, the V of A final, oh, let's write this is final rather instead of before, initial, okay, right. Um, hang on a minute, let me just fix this. So there's a little bit less confusion. Um, it'll be the mass of A, the final velocity of A, plus the mass of B, the final velocity of B. Now you need to write one of these two versions down because there is a mark allocated to letting you know that in fact these two things are actually um, are, uh, con um, the momentum is conserved in a linear in a linear system. Oh, sorry, my words suddenly won't come. These two things are conserved in a linear system and they are in an isolated system because in the middle space. So therefore, you have to write either this one or this one to get your mark. Okay, so the total mass of the thing is 3.6 times 10 to the 19. Okay, so we know that this is 3 comma 6 times by 10 to the 19. Okay, and now because we're working in velocities, we need to decide which direction is positive. So let's choose towards Orion as positive because that's how we were originally. So that is going to be five. Now equals, now we've got two fragments here, A and B. They've told us that one is moving at eight meters per second and the other is moving at two. But we don't have the velocity of either of them. I mean, the mass of either of them. But they've asked us to prove that fragment A is a mass of 2.52 times 10 to the 19 kilograms. So do you agree if I let the mass of A be X and I've got its original and its final velocity of eight plus the mass of B has to be 3.6 times 10 to the 19 minus x. No mass is lost. It breaks up into two fragments perfectly, okay? So therefore, this mass is going to be 3 comma 6 times by 10 to the 19 minus x, okay? Multiplied by negative 2 because it's going in the opposite direction, okay? Everybody happy with that? So therefore, we've got um, 5 times 3.6 times 10 to the 19 is equal to 8x plus, I'm going to do this quite slowly, so it becomes minus 2 times by 3.6 times 10 to the 19 minus times the minus is a plus 2x. Okay, so do you agree that that, that 2x plus 8x is 10x? And this will all go to the other side. So if I write it out, it's going to be 5 times by 3.6 times 10 to the negative, to the 19, not negative 19. Why is that suddenly a negative? That's a positive. Okay, this is a minus. When I take it across, it becomes a plus 2 times 3.6 times 10 to the 19 is equal to 10x. So 3 plus 5 plus 2 is 7, so I can actually just write this as 7 times by that, is equal to 10x, and now I can solve for x quite easily if I can find my calculator. So let's go get out the calculator. 
So have a look at the Sunday evaluation. Um, hum, 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 hum. There we go. So we've got seven, seven times by three point six exponent. No, that's not an exponent. Bad canvas. Times by ten to the nineteen bracket all divided by 10 equals so that becomes 2.52 times 10 to the 19 ta-da we have just proven that the fragment of mass ma mass of fragment is 2.52 times by 10 to the 19 so x equals 2.52 times by 10 to the 19 kilograms done then it says, hence determine the impulse experienced by asteroid fragment A. Okay, so do you agree that impulse, impulse, okay, impulse, okay, is F delta X, but it's also equal to M delta P. So since we don't know the force and we don't know the displacement, we have to use M delta P. Sorry, M delta V. Let's try again. M delta V. So that is going to be the mass of it, which is 2, 5, 5, 2, times by 10 to the 19. Its final velocity is 8 minus initial velocity of 5. So therefore, its impulse is going to be... 2,52 times 10 to the 19 multiplied by 3, which is 7.56. 7,56 times by 10 to the 19. And now you just have to be careful because they've asked us to measure the impulse. An impulse is in Newton's seconds. It doesn't matter that you've used M. Sorry, then that is actually delta T. Sorry. Um, it doesn't matter that you've actually used the change in momentum because we know the change of momentum is equal to um, impulse. It doesn't matter that you've used that formula. What matters is that you are you working out impulse and therefore you have to use the impulse um, units, which is Newton's seconds. So therefore the answer for this is 7,56 times by 10 to the 19. Newton seconds. Right, now, before we read the next question, let me just erase all this writing. Okay, now it says the two fragments move apart from each other and after some time their centers of mass are 150 kilometers apart. Calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force that the two asteroid fragments exert on each other. Hmm. So they've kind of very sneakily stuck a universal law of gravitation question at the end of this momentum question. So let's just think about this. F is equal to G, M1, M2 over R squared. Now the mass of the first one, first of all, the SI units for mass are kilograms. And we know what the mass of the first one is, and we can work out the mass of the second one, so that's not a problem. The radius is the distance between their centers of mass, but it has to be in meters. So we have to change this 150 kilometers to meters. And luckily for us, G is a constant, which we don't have to remember because it is on our formula sheet. And big G is given as 6.67 times 10 to the minus 7. So, first things first, we're going to work out what the other mass is, the other part of it, since this is 2.52. So, this one's mass is 2,52 times by 10 to the 19. But we started at 3.6 times by 10 to the 19. So, all we have to do is say 3.6 minus 2.52. And we end up with 1.08. So this is 1,08 times by 10 to 19 kilograms. Okay, and then the next thing we need to do is convert this 150 kilometers to meters. So 150 kilometers equals 150 
thousand meters because there are a thousand meters in a kilometer. Right, now that we've got all the information we need, we can substitute into this formula and work it out. We've got F is equal to six comma six seven times by 10 to the negative 11 multiplied by the mass of A which is 2,52 times 10 to the 19, multiplied by B, which is 1,08 times by 10 to the 19, all over the radius, which is 150,000 squared. Okay, so now let's get our calculator out. So let's just clear and fractions. So we've got 6.67 exponent negative 11 multiplied by 2.52 exponent, oh that's a log exponent, that's just weird. Let's try again. Exponent 19 multiplied by 1.2 Zero 0.08 exponent, let's try again, exponent 19, all over 150, 1, 2, 3 squared. What happened? Let's just go back. Let's just delete. That's 15,000, squared. It's weird. Okay, so equals. There we go. 8.0, that can't be right. That can't be right. Okay, so I tell you what, let's work out the numerator first and then we'll do the denominator. 6.67 hmm. 6.67 exponent negative 11, I think it's time for a new calculator, times by 2.52 exponent 19 times by 1.08 exponent 19 equals, right? Then we divide it by bracket 150 one, two, three, bracket, squared. Now grade 12s, I know it's ridiculous, but the number of people that I've marked where they write, even write 150,000 squared, but then forget to put the squared in their calculation and then get it wrong. Oh, and it is right. 8.068, so we run up to two decimal places. So it's 8.07 times by 10 to the 17. So that equals 8,07 times by 10 to the 17 newtons. So that's the force between the two fragments. Wow. Right, let's do another question. It says a skateboarder is practicing his tricks. Okay, a sequence of tricks at a local skate park on a half pipe. So this is a half pipe, right? So it says, what does it say? It says his total mass of the skateboarder and the skateboard is 75 kgs. The skater leaves point A 2.4 meters above the ground. He skates down the ramp. Okay, down the ramp. Okay, toward point B, this is point B in case you didn't realize, and that's point A, I don't know why it's got cut off. Okay, and what they are seeing is that he reaches point B, which is 1.6 with the speed of 3,75 meters per second, just by rolling along without using his feet. So in other words, all of that is from gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. It is not from him causing anything. It says the skateboarder has not oiled the wheels of his skateboard for some time. So there's significant friction between the axles of the wheel and the wheels of the skateboard. So there is a frictional force. There is a frictional force. 
Okay, that's interesting. Now let's see what they say. They say state in words the work energy theorem. Okay, so what they're asking us to do is state in word the work energy theorem. So what they're really asking or saying to you is that you're going to be using the work energy theorem in this question. And what is the work energy theorem? The work energy theorem states that basically a change in kinetic energy is equal to the work done. A change in the kinetic energy is equal to the work done on the object. Okay, now it says calculate the work done by the gravitational force on the skateboard as he moves from point A to point B. So they've been very nice. They're asking just about the gravitational force uh, that's work done on the skateboarder. Okay, so do you agree that he has gone from a height of 2.4 meters to a height of 1.6 meters. So we are just looking at the gravitational potential energy work done, okay? So we know that the gravitational force on the skateboarder, okay, it says calculate the work done by the gravitational force, okay? So we know that work done is equal to F delta X, okay? F delta X. So we know the difference in height. The difference in height is 2.4 minus 1.6. We also know the force due to gravity is going to be mg delta x. That's what we're looking at here. That's what we're looking to work out is mg delta x. Okay. So therefore, we've got the mass at 75. We've got the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8. Okay, and the delta x is going to be 2 comma 4 minus 1 comma 6. So let us put that in our calculators now and see if we can get an answer. Okay, so let's clear that. And we've got 7.5 multiplied by 9.8 multiplied by 2.4 minus 1.6. Let's try again, minus 1.6, close bracket equals, SD button, 58.8 joules, 58,8 joules. Please remember that you are, always have to look at what you're working out and then work from what you're working out and get the appropriate units, okay? Please be careful about that. Right, so now let's do the next question. It says use the work energy theorem to determine the work done by the frictional force exerted on the skateboard. Okay, let's think about that. They said use the work energy theorem to determine the work done by the frictional force of the skateboard. Okay, so we've done some of it already, but let me show you what I'm thinking. What should happen, okay, is that all the potential energy over here, okay, what should happen is this, EP, theoretically, EP plus EK, or if you guys notice, U, U, U and K, at A should equal U plus K at B. That should happen if there is no frictional force. Okay, do you agree? But we have just worked out the potential energy difference here, okay? So we can, but there's no kinetic energy over here. Do you agree there's no kinetic energy? So all the potential energy is, all of the energy at A is potential energy. So we can go MGH, which is at A, is equal to MGH at B, the potential energy, plus the kinetic energy, okay? Plus, they've told us there's energy due to friction. So this is going to be the work done due to friction. Okay. Now, we've already worked out this MGH of A minus MGH of B. We've just worked it out. It's 58.8 joules. is going to equal the kinetic energy plus the work done. So we've already worked this out. They've made it easy for us. This is 58,8. 
is equal to the kinetic energy at this point. They tell us his velocity 3.75. So it's going to be a half times his mass of 75 times 3,75 plus the work done against the friction, right? So if we look that up, I mean, if we calculate that, we've got 0 0.5, let's try again, multiplied by 75, multiplied by 3.75 equals 140.63. This isn't working. Let me just try it again. Okay, let me just try this again. Let's just erase all ink. Okay, let's do it properly. Let's do it from the beginning. So we should have mu plus k at A is equal to mu plus k at B, right? But they do tell us that there is a force of friction. So some of this energy is converted into work done against the friction. Agreed. So we don't have any kinetic energy yet. It says the skater leaves 0.8, 2.4 meters above the ground. So he's assuming that there's no kinetic energy. So we've got the mass of this guy, which is 75, times acceleration due to gravity, which is 9,8, times by his height of 2.4, is equal to the mass of this guy over here, which is 7,5. I need more space. Let's write it down here. 7,5 times 9,8, times 2.4 is equal to 7,5 times by 9,8. Why is it 7,5? It's 75. Multiplied by his new height of 1,6 plus his kinetic energy. His kinetic energy says that he reaches us with a speed of 3.75. So it's a half times his mass of 75, times the speed of 3,75 squared, plus the energy that was used up against friction. Okay, so therefore we can see that this, if I can find my, why does it keep disappearing? It's weird. I'm sure I don't close it. Very weird. Where is it going now? Okay, I don't know what's going on with my calculator. There it is. Okay, let's try again. So we've got 75 times 9.8 times 2.4 equals minus bracket 75 times 9.8 times 1.6 bracket bracket equals so it was 588 that was the mistake this was supposed to be 588 joules. Okay, now I'm happier. Now we need to subtract the kinetic energy, which is going to be minus bracket 0 0.5 times 75 times 3.75 squared close bracket equals, that's much better, 60.66. So the, for the work done against friction is 60,66 joules. So the work done is 60,66 joules. Okay, the skateboarder thinks about constructing in kind of plane to join points A to B, oh my word, to provide an alternate route between these two points. How much work done by the gravitational force, how would the work done by the gravitational force change if we were to roll from point A to point B along the inclined plane instead of following the curved track? 
answer only increases, decreases, or remains the same. Okay, now listen, you need to remember that the gravitational force only works in one direction from here to here, okay? It doesn't care whether you're going up, around, whether you do loops or whatever. It's just going from here to here. So the difference in height is still going to be 0, 0,8 meters. It doesn't matter that you've gone along this route or along this route. We're not talking about energy used up or friction or anything else. We are just, just talking about along the gravitational work done against the gravity and therefore it's going to remain the same. It has to remain the same. Right, let's do another question. Okay, so this question says three charges, J, K and L are arranged on a horizontal plane, right? So that um, angle JKL is 90 degrees. That's quite nice. The charges are minus 4 microcoulomb, plus 2 microcoulomb, and plus 8 microcoulomb. Remember what's micro? It's milli micro. So it's 10 to the minus 6, okay? J and K are 50 millimeters apart, and K and L are 100 millimeters apart. And it says J and L are fixed, while K is free to move. State in words Coulomb's law. Okay, so Coulomb's law is equal to F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. That's Coulomb's law. So basically what you need to realize is that if we therefore um, work out what Coulomb's law is, we can see that it's pretty obvious that it's going to be the same as the universal law of equation of so it means the universal law of gravitation, except for the fact, except for the fact that it is actually um, using charges instead of masses, okay? So therefore you can see that what Coulomb's law is stating is that force is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the distance between them squared, okay? So it's inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. Now it says calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force between J and K. So they just want the electromagnetic static, electrostatic force between them. So we know F is equal to K Q1 Q2 over R squared. We've just stated that using Coulomb's law, but it is on the formula sheet. And K is a formula, I mean, is a constant of 9 times by 10 to the 9. So K is 9 times by 10 to the 9, and you should be able to find it on your formula sheet. So if we've got F is equal to 9 times by 10 to the 9, Q1, well, it doesn't matter, we can use J as Q1. Now remember, you need to know that micro is 10 to the negative 6 because you have to put this in coulombs. So it's a negative, and also you don't put the negatives and positives in because that just tells you if it's attraction or repulsion. In this case, it's attraction because they're oppositely charged, but they didn't ask for that. They asked for just the magnitude. So therefore, it's just 4 times by 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by 2 times by 10 to the negative 6 all over r, which is the distance between them. But now listen, the distance has to be in meters. So we have to take our 50 millimeters and divide by a thousand. So it becomes 0, 0, 5 meters. So this is 0, 0, 5 meters all squared. Right, so let's pop this in our calculator. So it becomes 9 exponent 9 multiplied by 4 exponent negative 6 multiplied by 2 exponent negative 
6 equals divided by bracket not point not 5 bracket squared equals so f is 28 comma 8 newtons this force here is 28 comma 8 newtons fair enough done that now it says draw a free body diagram showing the electrostatic force exerted on k due to the charges j and k share but also show on the vector diagram how the net force can be determined okay so do you agree we want to show the electrostatic forces exerted on k due to charges j so in other words here is k and here is j and here is l okay so what you need to realize is that k and J should have attracted forces, okay? So there be, should be forces of attraction towards J from K, right? But there also will be, this is a free body diagram, sorry. Okay, so erase it. So J, I'm gonna label this now, is gonna be the force of J on k then there'll be this force here of l on k is going to be pushing it this way because it's going to be a force of repulsion okay so this is the force of l on k and then it says show also show on the vector diagram how the net force can be determined so do you agree the net force this would be our resultant. Our resultant, we can do it one of two ways. We could do a, um, a parallelogram direction, and you can say that that obviously is F resultant. Okay, right, excellent. Now, I just need to draw my, get rid of that. Okay, so that is what your vector diagram would look like. It's a free body diagram. I haven't done this properly because it should touch these lines should touch and obviously i should be using a ruler so this is the force of l on k it's a force for repulsion so it's pushing k back this is the force of j on k and it's pulling it down therefore the resultant force is going to be this way okay done now it says calculate the magnet direction of the net electrostatic force exerted on K due to charges J and L. So that's what we're going to do now. We're actually going to work it out. So we've done J on K. It is 28.8 newtons down. So this is 28,8 newtons down. Now what we need to do is work out the electrostatic force of L on K. So let's do that. So we have to erase this. Okay, so we've got 9 times by 10 to the 9. Q1 is going to be 2 times by 10 to the negative 6. Q2 is going to be 8 times by 10 to the negative 6 millimicro. And the distance here is 100 millimeters that so we divide by 1,000. So it's going to be 0, 0,1 squared. Okay, grade 12, so we've run out of time. So what I would like to suggest is that we come back to this, but like I said, not tomorrow, because tomorrow what I'm going to do is do some chemistry, because you're writing physics on Friday. So, and then Monday is chemistry. So I'm going to do chemistry tomorrow, which is Tuesday, and then Wednesday and Thursday I'll do physics, and then Friday I'll do chemistry again. Right, so we will leave this for Wednesday. I hope you have a good day and please study well. Cheers.